Okay, am I on? I am. Uh, good morning. It is a blessing to be with you. And there are a number of things I want to say before I actually get into the lesson. Uh, one thing to add to what Victor said about uh, India. We have a brother in our congregation who um, travels every other year on campaigns and stuff. The Indian government for many years, if you know anything about India, you know it's, it's like 80% Hindu. The, the government had been, um, shall we say, kind to Christians. They, they pretty much let us do what we wanted to do. But the current prime minister is, is of, of a different ilk, and it's becoming much more difficult. Uh, we have uh, some churches over there that have been shut down by the government. And so not only do they have the COVID problem, but uh, a really a bigger problem because COVID will come and go. Uh, but so anyway, you need to pray for that as well. Uh, there are a number of thank yous that I need to, to make. Um, first of all, thank you to the elders for allowing me this time to, to uh, speak this morning. Uh, thank you uh, to Keith and Anzi. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but she knows how to cook. And uh, I had a, a great meal last night, but, but far more important than that, just the great uh, fellowship uh, with, with them. I also want to say thank you so much for your prayers for my wife, Linda. In uh, November, on November the 15th of 2019, uh, she'd been diagnosed a, a month or so earlier with severe spinal stenosis, whatever that is. And she was supposed to have surgery on November the 15th, but on November the 12th, she, she fell and broke her arm. So she had surgery on November the 15th, but it was put a plate in her arm. And so then on March the 9th of last year, she had surgery. Uh, they did two fusions, a uh, plate in her back, 10 screws. Uh, it was a big dog, you know, surgery. But the Lord really blessed her. And we went back on March the 9th of this year. Uh, one of the things, she had to wear this fusion belt for two hours every day. It didn't hurt her. In fact, you didn't even know it was on. You'd punch a button and it would do whatever it's supposed to do. And the doctor said, throw it away. I said, what do you mean? He says, throw it in the trash. You can't recycle them. She's good. And so um, I think it was in January, whenever it was, she took the grandkids to Six Flags. I'd rather be working than go to Six Flags with grandkids. I love my grandkids. But uh, b bottom line is, thank you so much for your prayers uh, for her. Um, and then, as I said in Bible class, uh, thank you for, um, for the many, many years. It's been well over, I think 13, some, somewhere in that ballpark that we've had fellowship and, and I, I'm deeply grateful. The religious people thought that she was beneath them. They would say things such as, I would never do that. Or, I can't believe that she would show her face in public. To say that she had an inferiority complex would be a massive understatement. 
And because of the way people looked at her, she lived a highly immoral life. One morning, Jesus was teaching Bible class. You can find this in John chapter 8. And they brought her to him. They said, teacher, that was rich. They no more viewed him as the teacher of Israel than you view me as a nuclear physicist. The teacher in the law, Moses says, we should stone such women. What do you say? A couple of interesting facts. Where's the man? For under the law, they both were to be executed. But we discover they did not care at all about this woman. In fact, the text says they were trying to trap him. And they've got him, don't they? If he says, yes, stone him or stone her, they could then say, hold the phone. Or they wouldn't say hold the phone, but something like that. Uh, what's all this stuff you've been spouting about love and forgiveness and turning the other cheek? If he says, no, we'll, we'll let her go this time. Excuse me? I, I thought you said you're the son of God. Are you going to go against your father? And so he bends down and he begins to write something. If you're ever in a Bible class or you hear a sermon from John 8 and the teacher, preacher says, this is probably what he wrote. After the class or after the sermon, go up to him and say, you're full of baloney. Do it in a Christ-like way, okay? I don't have a clue what he wrote. But he stands up and he says, here's the deal. Whichever of you is without sin, pick up a rock and chunk it at this girl. And he bends down and begins to write again. And the Bible says that one by one they, they all left. When he stands up, it's him and the girl. Where are your accusers? Did no man condemn you? No one, sir. Jesus then says two things. Number one, I don't condemn you either. Number two, knock it off. Live your life, leave your life of sin. The aim of my lesson this morning is to encourage you and I to be evangelistic. And you might say, what's that story got to do with evangelism? A lot. Because you and I are the woman. I'm not saying you've committed adultery. But one thing we've all done, we've sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. We have become proficient sinners. There are Christians, and you may be one of these, who have already determined, here's what I want to ask God when I get to heaven. You know, someone may say, Father, I 
I had a terrible, horrific, debilitating disease that I suffered with for years. Why didn't you heal me? My favorite. This is my favorite. One of my teachers in preaching school said, when I get to heaven, the first question I'm going to ask God is, who wrote Hebrews? I love that. I love that. I think I know my first question. How could you love me? You and I make a grave error. If we look down our nose at this girl in Romans uh, in John 8 or someone else who commits serious sins and think that we are superior to them. Going back to the woman, I'll say one more thing and we'll mosey on. Wouldn't it be wonderful if she was one of the 3,000 baptized on the day of Pentecost? I'm not saying she was. I have no idea. But it's not a stretch. I, I think I would like to talk to that girl. Open your Bibles to John chapter 12. You know, Jesus did many things while he was on the earth. We could give a lot of descriptions to him. One would be that he was a seed sower. We're going to look at John chapter 12, beginning verse 23. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Two points this morning. Number one, the power of a seed. And number two, the fact that you and I are to be spiritual farmers. The power of a seed. If I had a kernel of corn, and I put it in my pocket, it would have no value. I mean, zero. But if I were to plant it in good soil and it received proper rain, proper sunshine, it will produce a corn stalk with two ears of corn. Now I'm fixing to throw some numbers at you. Okay, I read these. I can't spell farm. No, I can spell farm. P-H-A-R-R-M-D. A few farmers out there, you know the D is silent. So I can spell it, okay? But that's, that's it. Um, but here's what I know. Each ear would have 21 rows of kernels with 45 kernels in a row, which equals 1,890 kernels of corn, and if you planted them, they would produce 3,572,100 kernels of corn, which would produce enough corn to feed a city for a year, and if you planted all of those kernels, you could feed a country for a year. Let's go back to John 12 and focus only on verse 24. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. There may be multiple applications, but here's one. If I want to bear fruit, I've got to die to myself. The key to our being evangelistic is not a preacher 
browbeating us. If I get up here and say, listen, from now on, every time you're in the store, you talk to somebody about Jesus. Every time you're talking to your neighbor, you talk to them about Jesus. Every time you're with a co-worker, you talk to them about Jesus. And if you don't, you're a bunch of no good, sorry reprobates. You don't love the Lord, you don't love the lost, and you're going to burn in hell. Would that motivate you? It would. It motivates you to tell the elders, don't ever let him preach again. But that'd be what it motivates you to do. It wouldn't motivate you to share Jesus. We must die to ourselves. In Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 14, a man comes to Jesus. He says, my son is an epileptic. And oftentimes he, he falls in the fire or into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they, they couldn't heal him. Jesus is not happy. In fact, he's rather harsh with the disciples. He says two things. He, he says they are unbelievers. And they are perverse. And he heals the kid. Later in private... The disciples say to Jesus, why couldn't we do the job? He says, because you have microscopic faith. The next thing he says, if you have an NIV, it's a terrible translation. Terrible translation. And you don't have to know Greek to know that. I know a little Greek. He's 5'5", five, five, runs a restaurant in South Garland, but that's it, okay? Because then IV has him saying, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it's going to move. That can't be what he said. And it's not what he said. Because all of us in this room, surely we have at least baby faith. And we're not moving a lot of mountains, are we? What he said is, if you have faith like, or as a mustard seed. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus will speak of the fact that the mustard seed, though very small, it grows in this tree that houses the birds of the heavens. Mustard seeds are one to two millimeters in size. Now for those of us who are metrically challenged, that means the largest mustard seed is .079 inches. Pretty small, right? But if we want to be evangelistic, if we're going to be evangelists, we have to have a faith that is growing. So, yes, we need to die to ourselves. And yes, we also need to have a faith that's growing. That leads us to point number two. That we need to be spiritual farmers. In Matthew 21, Mark 12, and Luke 20, Jesus tells, uh, it's the same parable. Um, we don't have time to dissect the parable. Uh, we'll say a few things. There are four principal characters in the parable. There's God, there's Jesus, there's the Israelite nation, and there's you and me. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. I have already conclusively proven to you, I know how to spell farm, but I can't spell vineyard, okay? So don't ask me any questions about vineyards. He builds a wall around it, digs a wine press, puts up a watchtower, 
but he hires some guys to take care of it. He leaves. At harvest time, he sends some servants to collect the fruit. In Matthew's account, they beat one, they stone one, they kill one. So he sends more a second time. And they treat them the same way. He has one son. He says, they'll respect my son. And he sends him. And when they see him coming, they say, this is the heir. We'll kill him. And the inheritance is ours. And they killed him. Jesus then turns to, to those who are hearing the parable. And he says, what do you think the landowner is going to do to those guys? And they say, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. Now listen to, this is Matthew 21, uh, verse 43. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. You and I are part of that group. Did you know that? Now, I don't believe, you're free to disagree, okay? I don't believe this parable is exclusively an evangelistic text. I think it's, I think it's a broad text. Um, it's like John 15. Uh, John 15, you remember Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. I don't know what you've heard over the years, if you were raised in the church, what the preacher said, but, but when I was younger, uh, they use John 15 as a purely evangelistic text. And the fruit there was souls. I, I don't believe that. That doesn't mean I'm right, okay? Now, are souls involved in it? I would say absolutely yes. But what about the fruit of the Spirit, you know, Galatians 5? What about when you and I good, do benevolent deeds, we give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus? To me, John 15 and the parable we just looked at, they're broad teachings. But now let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 5 through 9, which is an evangelistic text. Paul says in verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. So it's neither he who, who plants or waters that's anything, but it's God who makes it grow. When you or I teach the gospel to someone, and they're baptized into Christ, we dare not say, look what I did. No. We praise God for what He did. I know verse 9. I know verse 9. Depending on your translation, it will say, we're either co- or fellow workers with God. Now, in the original language, it says we, we're labors with Him. Are, are we in the field? We are. But He does the heavy lifting. We're along for the ride. So, here's our conclusion. Two questions. And I ask... I need to answer these questions too. Have you, have I died to myself? And number two, is your, is my faith growing? We all know that, that COVID has, it's caused so many problems, so many. But it should not affect our evangelism. Now, it, will, it, it can affect the way we evangelize. 
Let me give you a, a number of ways that we can evangelize. Number one is World Bible School. Now, if your knowledge of World Bible School is 10 years back and before, then you're thinking, okay, World Bible School is sending lessons in the mail to people on the other side of the world. Now, we still do that. But you can also teach World Bible School on the internet. One thing that my congregation has done, uh, we have what we call web targets. And we took our church building as, as the, the, the middle of the radius, and we went out 25 miles. Anytime someone does a Google search, study the Bible, free Bible lesson, there are over 400 word combinations that we have that if any of those combinations come in and they click on World Bible School, our congregation gets that student. And so these are people who live in our backyard. And so not only can we teach them, we can follow up with them. The phone. Uh, I assume you know this, but if, now I don't have COVID, so don't, don't get worried. I've had my shots and everything. But uh, if I had COVID and you did not, and I called you on the phone, did you know you wouldn't get it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's pretty, this is an amazing thing, but it, it's not that amazing. Uh, I want to be careful here, and I, I, I am serious. In fact, I don't know if it was Victor or, or the brother that got it first. I think it's the brother that got it first. And I'm not here to politicize anything. But, but we all know that everybody is not approaching COVID in the same way. Okay? Uh, and, and I would never mock or make fun of someone who, who it, it troubles them. Okay, it, it's not a minor thing. I know that. But there are people who, who would be happy to talk to you face to face. And so you could study with them in that way. Um, what about living a Christ-like example? In Acts chapter 1, as Theophilus begins his uh, letter to Luke. I said that wrong, didn't I? Luke wrote Acts. As Luke... <laughs> do you know I'm a public speaker? I get paid to do this. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing? Anyway, uh, he speaks of all that Jesus began to do and teach. And I don't know if there's significance there or not, but the doing is before the teaching. You see, it's like when you had small children, and even when they were teenagers. You can't fool them into what you like, what you don't like. I love sports. I wish I didn't. I, I really wish I did not, but I do. Just like I hate liver, and I'm glad I hate liver, okay? And you may be able to tell me why liver is really good for you. And I'm going to say, God bless you, eat all the liver. You have my liver. Um, but uh, if, if you were to go up to one of my children today and say, you know, your dad doesn't care about sports. I'm not sure if they'd fall down laughing, but they'd say, you're nuts. We can't hide who we are. We can't hide what makes us happy, what makes us sad, what makes us mad, and all that sort of jazz. And you know what? I can preach and I can teach. But if I'm not living what I teach and preach, no one's going to listen. And when we live a Christ-like life, that's going to open up some doors. 
churches grow as brethren are in the field. I have no idea how many times I've taught this in Cameroon to congregations, to leaders. Churches don't grow because of preachers. I'm convinced I've said that to you before because I say that a lot. Churches grow because of members. I'm not knocking preachers. I'm not anti-preacher. I are one, okay? But I know this. You'd have the Apostle Paul as your preacher, and you wouldn't grow if the members are not in the field. A harvest, whether it is a harvest of souls, or a harvest of grain, or harvest of anything, is based on how much is planted. And the key to Loveland growing is not Michael. I'm not knocking Michael. The key to my congregation growing is not Richard Blaiso. I love Richard with all my heart. He's a great preacher. But Richard is one man. Michael is one man. You are many. We are many. And that's how churches grow. Uh, Jesus, and I'm going to add this and, and we're done. Uh, Jesus had an, added another way that we can evangelize. It's in Matthew 9.38. He says, pray that the Lord will send workers into his field. I don't know if you take Brotherhood publications. I don't know. You know I, I travel a lot. Uh, in the last 30 years, I've worked with five, over 500 congregations in the United States. Uh, and so I... I talk to a lot of elders, a lot of deacons, a lot of preachers, a lot of members. It doesn't make me smart. It just, I have some, some info. Uh, church is not doing well. It's not. I, I, I wish I could say we're going gangbusters, but we're not. Why is that the case? There are a lot of answers. I mean, I've... We could speak, we could have a series of sermons on that. But one of them is very simple. We're not planting the seed. I'm not mad. See, I'm smiling, okay? But, but we're not planting the seed. Now, I'm not a fool. I, I'm not saying that everybody you talk to about Jesus is going to say, sign me up. That's not going to happen. I, I know that. And, and in Cameroon, and this was true in America, I would say, when I was a kid. So we're talking about a long time ago. Uh, but certainly in Cameroon, the number one way they evangelize is door to door. Now, if you love door to door, God bless you. I'm not here to offend you. But I think that's one of the least effective ways to evangelize. Because you're picking on strangers. Somebody knocks your door. So I want to talk to you about Jesus. Why would they let you in? Now, when I was at Sunset, we were knocking doors in Lubbock, and uh, me and Creighton Wilson, we lady answers the door. Uh, Ma'am, my name's Jim Corner. This is Creighton Wilson. We're Christians. We'd like to study the Bible with you. Are you Jehovah's Witnesses? Oh, no, ma'am. Oh, no, ma'am. Are you Mormons? Oh, no, ma'am. Oh, no. Come on in. Well, we, we got to the study. It, it didn't bear fruit, but we got to preach. We got to plant the seed. And that's how the church grew initially. And that's how the church will grow today. It'll never change. You know that? That, that dynamic will never change. And so hopefully, you and I can be more involved in sharing the gospel. We're going to sing the song that Michael is going to lead his invitation song. Uh, I know some of you, I don't know all of you. And there may be someone in this audience who is not a child of God. And, and to say that we're glad you're here is, oh, we're glad you're here. And, and I am sincere about that. 
And if you believe in the Lord Jesus, and if you're prepared to repent, that's just a fancy Bible word that means you're going to give your life to Jesus and confess Him before this body of people, we would be thrilled uh, to see you be born again. But obviously the majority in this room are Christians. A lot of questions I could ask. One is, are you in the seed sowing business? Uh, maybe, maybe you need prayer for, for boldness. Uh, maybe you need someone to mentor you and, and help you uh, become more evangelistic. There may be a sin or a temptation you're dealing with that just seemingly is beating your brains in. Uh, we would love to pray with you and for you. There may be needs you have that have nothing to do uh, with sin or anything. It's just, you need your brothers and sisters to pray for you. So if we can help you in any way, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing.